mail inviting you to visit the church. Oh, I see some of you. Bless your hearts. Very good. Two of my neighbors came over. Uh, and we sent cards to uh, a number of zip codes surrounding the church saying we are open for business and to come and visit us. It, it wasn't worded that way, but <laughs> it, was, it looked really nice. Told about the times when we meet and the church. And one of my neighbors said, you didn't say what day you meet. And we looked at the card, we looked at the front, we looked at the back, and we thought, oh. in the editing process, we told what hour we meet and when our studies are, we had taken off the day. <laughs> but fortunately, at least my two neighbors, they said, well, it says SDA, we know it's on Saturday, but you might want to put that on there next time. <laughs> so we're going to all probably have to come back again tomorrow because I think a bunch of people are going to show up tomorrow. <laughs> Matter of fact, one of my neighbors said, do you guys meet Sunday also? I said, not typically, no. <laughs> so you might get some visitors. Well, we're glad you're here if you're visiting, and uh, we hope that you find that uh, we're loving Christian people. You know, before I get into the message for today, I did not want to let the occasion go unmentioned that, of course, tomorrow is the 4th of July. It is the uh, celebration of the birth of our country that, um, uh, you know, we're thankful for the freedoms we enjoy to gather like this and worship according to our conscience. But, you know, freedom is an expensive business. I want to take you back, not to 1776, but I want to take you back to 1863. Probably one of the most famous speeches in history. It's only 250 words. It's the Gettysburg Address. And I remember going to the Lincoln Memorial and uh, seeing it etched on the wall there. Um, Lincoln, at that occasion, was invited to share a few appropriate remarks. Uh, he was not the main speaker. The main speaker was a, um, a famous orator named Edward Everett, who talked over two hours. And uh, Lincoln was just supposed to say a few appropriate remarks, and he jotted them down on a piece of paper on the train en route to Gettysburg. You know, up to that point, America had no military cemeteries. This was the first military cemetery, ground specifically dedicated to the soldiers. And uh, he prefaces his remarks pointing back to the 4th of July. How many of you know at least the first line of the Gettysburg Address? Four score and seven years ago, it's 87 years earlier, it was July 4th from 1863. That's when America had thrown off the yoke of bondage and decided we're going to be a country, a people without a king, we'd have a church without a pope, we'd have freedom of religion, freedom of government. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Of course, the country was in the midst of a civil war fighting over those principles because several southern states did not believe all men were created equal. And Lincoln said, well, we either believe it or we don't believe it. If we believe it, we should be ready to die for it because the revolutionaries died for that proposition. Now we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Can a nation, this America was the first great experiment based on these freedoms and these principles. Can any nation like that endure? It says, and we're met now on a great battlefield of that war. Uh, do you realize that in the Civil War, more soldiers died than all American wars, including Afghanistan, combined. The Gettysburg Battle, over 50,000 men died, not counting how many were wounded. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And we're met on a great battlefield of that war. And we've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. And it's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, 
We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. <laughs> well, the irony of that, he thought no one would remember what he said. No one remembers the two-hour speech. The world will little note nor long remember what we said here, but we can never forget what they did, for it is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus so nobly advanced. It's rather for us to here dedicate, be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. They died to provide freedom. Freedom is a bloody business. If you're a Christian, your freedom costs Jesus his blood. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Notice he says a nation under God. He talks about new birth and he talks about shall not perish, all taken from the Gospel of John which is going to be our study today. A year and a half later, Lincoln gave his blood and killed by someone who was pro-slavery. Freedom is a bloody business. Now, you know, friends, I sometimes grouse and complain like you do. If I get a new tax bill, I'm not too happy with our government. And there's a lot of dumb things that the government does. You don't have to say amen. I know you think it. <laughs> but um, uh, Mrs. Batchelor and I have traveled all over the world and we don't plan on moving to another country. Uh, people, anyone that wants to leave America is always free. Uh, but people are fighting to get in this country because of the opportunities and the freedoms we enjoy. But don't forget it was very expensive. So we're thankful for that. Can you say amen? The freedoms we enjoy. That is not our message for today. Our message for today I'm very excited about is from the Gospel of John. Please take your Bibles and join me. As you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, we're going to be studying the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And this will be part one. There are about 42 verses in this story, and we're probably going to get through about 14 of them today. And I'll read verses 1 through 14. Then we're going to back up, and this is going to sort of be an expository sermon where we're going to go verse by verse through this passage and find out what's happening here. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard, I'm sorry, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, being John the Baptist, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you've got nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, there's our passage that we're going to be taking a look at. This is uh, one of the beautiful stories in the Bible 
that helps us to understand the gospel. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Now keep in mind, John chapter 4 comes after John chapter 3. This story is juxtaposed with Nicodemus. Here you have two one-on-one -on -one experiences. John chapter 3, he talks to Nicodemus. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. John chapter 3, you've got an educated Jew who is wealthy with a good reputation. John chapter 4, you have an ostensibly uneducated non-Jew who is poor and has a bad reputation. John chapter 3, Jesus speaks about the new birth and the Pharisee doesn't get it. He's thinking literally. John chapter 4, Jesus talks about the living water and the Samaritan woman doesn't get it. She thinks he's talking literally. These stories are bookends. In John chapter 3, it represents the Jews. The Samaritans were the northern ten tribes. There had been a big civil war. The people in Judea had stayed true to the Lord. They had the temple down there. The Samaritans had turned to the idols of Bethel and Dan. And so there was this big rift between those two kingdoms, even in the Old Testament. Jesus going from Nicodemus to the Samaritan woman is like the two bookends. It's an alpha and omega. Jesus is saying, I can save man, woman, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, religious, non-religious, saint, sinner. It's the whole spectrum is presented in these two stories. Do you see that? So it's a wonderful study for us. We're going to take it verse by verse and go through these 14 verses. Let's reread the first few verses again. John 4, verse 1. And for our friends that are watching, sometimes people say, Pastor Doug, how do you find the Gospel of John in the first pages of your Bible? Because you only see I've got like that. It's my notes. <laughs> so you see, when you do television, it costs a lot of money when we broadcast hundreds of dollars a minute. And so the time I take looking for verses I copy and paste on my computer notes every verse I'm going to read in here. Time economy. I just have to say that every now and then because people seem mystified. How's he finding revelation in the first book of his Bible? I said, no, I know. It's in the back of the Bible. I copied it here. It's the same thing exactly. I just I pasted it here. Technology is great. Therefore, John 4 verse 1. When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. Now, did Jesus believe in baptism? He certainly did. First thing, he's baptized. Last thing he says, go teach and baptize. First thing in Acts, repent and baptize. Making a commitment to Christ is very important to the Lord. And so this was part of it. But, and it says, though Jesus personally did not baptize, but his disciples baptized. And when he knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing more than John. Now, in your Bibles, I want you to go to John chapter 3. We're just going to look at this real quick so you see. John chapter 3, it's not very far. Verse 22, let's read this. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained. It's after his time in Jerusalem with Nicodemus. They go down probably towards the Jordan a little bit. There, there's water and some of the tributaries to the Jordan. And there he remained with them, and he baptized. Now John was also baptized in Anon near Salem. John is on the Jordan River a little further north than where they are in Judea because there was much water there. And they came and they were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown in prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about, about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, speaking of Jesus, to whom you gave testimony, saying he was the Lamb of God. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John, it's not fair. Everyone's leaving our denomination, and they're going to their denomination. They're leaving our group, and they're going to his group. Now, you know what John said. He said, this is God's plan. My, I was supposed to introduce and announce Jesus. John the Baptist said, he must increase. I must decrease. My whole job was to transition people, to channel people to Christ. And he said, don't be jealous that they're following Jesus. That's why I pointed him out. So now Jesus' group is growing. Now, why does Jesus leave town? Because the Pharisees, who were already jealous about John the Baptist having so many followers, they didn't like John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he said, you need to be baptized to the religious leaders. They said, us? 
said, yeah, you're a brood of vipers. You, unless you repent and you're baptized, you'll be lost. And they were indignant about that. Well, Jesus, is a, he's cut from the same cloth as John the Baptist in his preaching. John the Baptist said, repent and be baptized. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, similar message. But now Jesus is getting so much more attention that it's getting the ire of the Pharisees. And Jesus said, you know, we probably ought to start working in a different area right now because I better head back up to Galilee where we're going to have less opposition. It says, he left Judea and he departed again to Galilee. Now Christ told his disciples when he sent them out preaching, Matthew 10, verse 23, when they persecute you in this city, arm yourself to the teeth for a battle. No, he said, flee to the other. Jesus said, if they persecute you in one place, if you're not making headway, go somewhere else, keep on preaching. He followed his own advice. He said, look, I'm not trying to stir things up prematurely. I know how my story is going to end. It's not time for that yet, so I'm heading up to Galilee. And then it goes on and it tells us uh, he went up to Samaria. Who were the Samaritans? We're going to take some time because they come up a lot in the whole gospel. This is a great place to explain that. Uh, in John 4, verse 3 and 5, it says he needed to go through Samaria. Now, you've got Judea is in the southern kingdom. North of Judea, you've got Samaria. Then north of that, you've got Galilee. Galilee was not just the area around the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee sometimes called the Sea of Tiberias. It's the same sea. But it reached inland all the way up into Nazareth and uh, Cana in that area. That was also called uh, Galilee. And most of Jesus' followers, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, they were called Galileans, and they had an accent, and it was a little different. But uh, they called that area Samaria because the Samaritans lived in this zone, and, you know, there was, you, you could take the river route and just go from the Jordan right up to Galilee, but that was not very direct, and so he needed to go through Galilee. But even more than that, Jesus had an appointment. Nothing Jesus did was by accident. He planned on going to the city in Galilee. And uh, I think you'll see as we go on that it it's, was really a fulfillment of prophecy in many ways. And he did it to teach a very important lesson to the disciples. But the Samaritans, it says, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And you know where the name Samaritan comes from? How many of you remember Ahab, wicked King Ahab? He was married to, what was her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. We all know about Jezebel. She fixed her makeup and they threw her out the window. Remember that story? No, you've got to read the Bible. That's a great story. Some... Ahab's father was called Amri. Amri was one of the kings in the northern kingdom when they had a civil war against Judah in the south. Amri wanted a new capital. He didn't want everyone going to Jerusalem. So you read here in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 24, and Amri bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And he built on the hill, and he called the name of the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer. So there was some guy named Shemer who lived a long time ago, and all the Samaritans' name is drawn from him. And so that's where you get the name Samaria. I know it's a little corruption of the original name Shemer, but... Uh, he owned this property. He sold it. became the new capital for the northern kingdom that was always at war with the southern kingdom. But because of the idolatry in the northern kingdom, they were the first ones to be judged by God. And in 721 BC, the Assyrians came down. They fought against the northern kingdom, and the king of Assyria took the ten tribes captive. Those ten tribes did not re assemble. Now, this is so important to understand. The, um, the tribe of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, when they were taken to Babylon, they ended up coming back again. They remained a unique, distinct people. But what happened when the ten tribes went to Assyria, they had already lived years on the border of Assyria, they began to intermarry with the Assyrians, and you're not going to find any people who are really distinct, pure blood members of the tribe of Issachar or Ephraim or Zebulun or Naphtali or Dan or any of the others. The reason we use the word Jew is because they're from the tribe of Judah. They did remain a lot more distinct. 
um, what happened is they sort of intermarried with the uh, Assyrians. So these 10 tribes are carried to the north, and um, then the king, well, let me read it to you here. In the ninth year of Hosea, this is 2 Kings 17.6, We got a little competition, sorry. <laughs> In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria. And he placed them in um, Hala and by Habor, the river Gozam, in the city of the Medes. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuleth, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharavim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession and they dwelt in the cities. But the problem was they weren't completely, uh, they, they weren't completely believing in the God of Judah. They were still worshiping idols. Lions began to attack them. And all these lions began to attack them. They said, what is it? And they said, we must not know the God of the land. So the king of Assyria sent some priests that were left from the tribes down. He said, you better teach them about the God of the land so the lions will stop attacking them. So they came to where they believed the five books of Moses. They practiced circumcision, but then they were still involved in a different kind of corrupt worship. So you read here in 2 Kings 17, 33, they feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations among whom they were carried away. So the Jews viewed the Samaritans as sort of mongrels. They were, they were keeping some of their religion, but they were really Assyrian. They are a Semitic people. You know where the word Semitic, when, when someone says you're anti-Semitic, people often think that means you're anti-Jewish. But if you don't like Arabs, you're anti-Semitic. The Semitics are people who came from Shem. A Shemite is a Semitic. And so it's not just Jews, it's actually any Semitic person who's from uh, you know, the Arabic uh, uh, range there. So they, they didn't like them at all. But what really was the deal breaker? You know, there's a lot of antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans. You know what it really did? It. You read in the book of Ezra, chapter 4, when they were starting to rebuild the temple, they came, the Samaritans, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's house, and they said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. They said, let's compromise. I know we don't worship exactly the same, but we worship Jehovah. Let us help you build the temple. And we've sacrificed to him since the days of Esher Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. They admit, we're imports, but we also are worshiping your God. When Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers in the houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord our God, as the King Cyrus, king of Persia, has commanded us. So they were spurned. The high priest realized that if we allow the Samaritans to help us build, they're going to bring their corruption of worship in, and we're going to be back where we were before we got carried off to Babylon. They said, no, we cannot let you because you guys do not believe all of the scriptures. You only believe the five books of Moses. And you're also involved in idolatry. And they had a number. Of, so there was a war that broke out, a spiritual civil war, if you will, between the Samaritans. And it goes on to say, then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. You've read the book of Nehemiah. They kept trying to stop them from building. So instead of them saying, let's join together, now they became enemies. That war went on all through the time of Christ. That's why Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because, uh, and the, the leper, 10 lepers are healed, but the one who comes back to say thank you is a Samaritan. And so he often accentuates that God still loves Samaritans, even though they don't understand everything. So uh, the Samaritans were persona non grata. As a matter of fact, if you got really upset, if you're a Jew and you wanted to cut someone down, you would say, you are demon possessed, you're evil, you're a dog, and you're a Samaritan. And so it was so bad. The reason that Jesus is sitting by the well is because the disciples did not want Jesus to risk contamination as they went into the nearby town of Sychar to buy food because the Jews were allowed to buy food from a Samaritan, but if a Samaritan offered you something, you are not to take it from them. 
They did not want the shadow of a Samaritan to land upon them because you, the Pharisees said you will be unclean if the shadow of a Samaritan lands on you. And I imagine that if the Jews were buying food in the afternoon, the Samaritans had fun trying to get the shadows on them <laughs> and just you know, run from them. It was really bad. So you've got to just know that when the disciples come back and Jesus is talking to a Samaritan, they're like, they're thunderstruck. And what made things even more amazing, it was not only a Samaritan, it was a woman. And you'll see that she's even shocked that Jesus is talking to her. So, a little background here. Where was this meeting? Now, I already alluded to it. It says, John 4, verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. It tells us it's in Sychar. A matter of fact, you can see a map that's on the screen. Now Sychar was in the middle of the promised land. And in the middle of the promised land, Jacob had lived for many years in a place called Shechem. Some of you remember the story in the Bible where Dana, Dinah rather, had, had uh, a, a brief affair with the prince of Shechem. And it ended up becoming a battle. And that's where Jacob was living during that time. And during the many years that Jacob lived in Shechem, Sychar is right there in the same area, he dug a well for all the flocks and the herds. The wells were often not in the town because from these wells they would often water the fox, and you don't want to live where there's too many flocks. You got a lot of flies, and it's not always pleasant. So they had this well outside the town, but it, it was a dry country, but a deep well and a very good well, and that well is still there today. In fact, I think we've got a picture of that on the screen. There it is. It's all, of course, everything in, in Israel now. They got a church on top of everything. And so I don't know what denomination, it may be some Orthodox church has this, but there is Jacob's well, and it dates back to the time of Jacob, and it is still producing good water, and it is a very deep well, hand-dug well. And so this is a real story about a real place. That place, Sychar, is in the middle of the Promised Land. It is between two mountains. You had Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And when the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, they were told that they were supposed to pronounce the blessings and the cursings from these two mountains. They divided the tribes, 50%, six tribes went on one side, and six of the 12 went on the other side, with a valley between. You know what was in the valley? Jacob's well. When the children of Israel came back into the promised land, half of them, a lot, a lot of people, stood on one mountain. Half of them stood on the other mountain. They reread, under the instruction of Joshua, the blessings and the cursings. In fact, you can read about this, Deuteronomy 11:29. Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land that you go to possess, you will put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Blessings if you obey. And like there, one of them would say, cursed is he that makes the blind to go out of the way. And all the people would say, amen. So they, were, they had this whole narration that Moses had given them. You read in Joshua 8:33, they finally did it. Then all of Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded that they should bless the people. The bullseye right in the middle of this whole thing was Jacob's well. So it's very significant that Jesus has this instruction about living water at the place where the covenant was ratified in the middle of the promised land. So it's at a well. And I started thinking about it. Jesus talks to this woman at the well. Where did Moses find his wife? It's at a well. You remember he defended the seven daughters of Jethro from these shepherds that were harassing them and he ended up marrying Zipporah. Uh, where did Jacob find Rachel? At a well. Not this well. It was in Haran. And I always liked the way it said he removed this stone cover. Jacob must have been pretty strong. It says he took the stone lid off himself. It used to take several shepherds to do it. And he saw Rachel. It says he kissed her and he wept. So that, that must have been some kiss. <laughs> but it was at a well. Where did Eliezer find a wife? For uh, Isaac, it was in Haran. It was by a well. Rebecca came out and she watered the camels. And, and by the way, those shepherd girls back then, you don't want to make them mad because it says that they would go out in the morning, 
sometimes in the afternoon. And they would fill their water pots. They did not have in central plumbing. And if you're carrying a porcelain pot that's got five gallons of water, try putting that on your head. And when Rebecca watered the caravan of camels, you know, one camel can drink 20 gallons of water? And you've got to pull that out of a deep well by hand? And then after you're done with that, you go home and you milk goats? Don't make those girls mad. <laughs> I'm serious. We had a neighbor up in the hills, and they milked goats, and the girls used to haul water. And I remember one city boy, uh, he had put his eye on one of these teenage girls and introduced himself. And she shook his hand and squeezed his hand. He went to his knees just for, for, for grip. <laughs> Milk and goats every day. <laughs> Pretty strong. So anyway, so it's interesting that it all happened at a well. Moses, Jacob, Rebecca, Jesus is now at a well. So I throw that in, in case there's any singles out there and you're wondering where you should be hanging out. And it's in the city of Sychar. The word Sychar it means drunken. And the word Shechem, this is the other city, it means shoulder. There may have been a hill that was shoulder shaped up there. And then don't forget this, it's in the middle of the promised land where the blessing and the cursing was. And it says it's the well on the plot of land that Jacob gave Joseph. Now who was Jacob's favorite son? Parents shouldn't be favorites, but a lot of them do it. Favorite for Isaac was who? Esau. Favorite for Rebekah? Jacob. Who was Jacob's favorite out of all his boys? Joseph. And he made such a big deal out of it, the brothers became jealous. It didn't play out well. Be careful about favoritism. But it is safe to say, and you can understand why that would be. I mean, Jacob only wanted one wife. He ended up with four. He never wanted four, but he ended up with four wives. And he just wanted Rachel. And the firstborn of Rachel was Joseph. And so he had this special love for Joseph. Joseph was the beloved son. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at, it says, here's this story. It's in the context of where the covenant was made. It's by the water. It's in a place where the father gave his beloved son the land. Have you read all the parables where it tells us that God has given the kingdom to his son? This world is given to Jesus. So pay attention to where it was. I think that's an interesting. If there was ever a sacred well, this is the one. Jacob drank from this well. Joseph and his brothers drank from this well. Joshua drank from this well. Elijah, Elisha, King Saul, David. And it's, a, it's got a lot of histories around this well in the middle of the promised land. Now when was the meeting? What time of day? Well, it tells us it was about the sixth hour. Sixth hour is what we would call noon. It's the, it's the high noon. When did Nicodemus come? Dark. So here Nicodemus comes in the dark. This woman comes in broad daylight. Again, look at the paradox but just between the two. And it says it's the sixth hour. When is it that Peter goes on the roof to pray and he learns he's supposed to take the gospel to the Gentiles? Sixth hour. And here Jesus is taking the gospel to a Gentile, the Samaritan woman, on the sixth hour. When Jesus was on the cross, the sixth hour, darkness suddenly covered the earth. The middle of the day when you'd think it would be the brightest, darkness came. And not only do we know what time of day it was, we know what time of year it was, because you can read in verse 35, I didn't read it during our verses earlier, but you look in verse 35, it says, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? So this takes place four months before the harvest. The harvest was usually the end of May, the 1st of June. This is happening the end of January. So sometimes people portray, and I probably have some paintings on the screen, that Jesus is with the woman at the well, and it's a hot, dry, dusty time. It's January. It's probably a sunny day, and it can still get warm in this country, even in the winter, uh, during that time of year. But it was probably, like I said, the end of January or something, four months before the harvest. Doesn't say Jesus is hot, it says Jesus is thirsty. You, just, you notice that, okay? And it says, while he's there, John ver, chapter 4, verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And it's our next question who is this woman? Well, she's one of the many people that lives in Sychar. 
and she's a Samaritan. Now, if it was bad for a Jew to talk to another Samaritan man, it's unthinkable that you would talk to a Samaritan woman. Do you know in the Bible that uh, there was a prayer in the Talmud? This is not in the scripture. I said in the Bible, it's, it's in the Jewish teachings. In the Talmud, some of the rabbis had a prayer, and in that prayer, they would thank God that they were uh, not a Gentile or a woman. I'm not saying God endorsed that. I'm just saying that the, the attitude towards women was not very good during this time. And so this woman comes from Samaria. Now, she comes alone. You know, women didn't, it wasn't safe for women to travel alone. When they would get water in the morning or later in the day, it was a social event. The women always went to the well together. Matter of fact, you can read when Rebecca waters the camels, Eliezer prays, he says, when it is time and the daughters of the land come out to fetch water. The women would all go out together. They did this for protection, even with Moses. It was the sisters all came together. They would always come together. This woman's alone. And we suspect that the women in Sychar did not like her very much because the men in Sychar liked her a little too much. Now, I know it doesn't say that, but... Uh, we suspect, no, it does actually say she had five husbands. So, you know, you don't get five husbands unless your fishing line is in the water quite a bit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So she had a reputation. She had five husbands and a character living with her. She had a reputation. She's not very popular with the women in town. And uh, she's coming in the middle of the day when they never came because she wants to come alone. She may be something of an outcast. But uh, you find out later, she talks to the men in the city. They all know her. So you've got this woman. She's had five husbands. And she comes. She's not wealthy. If she was wealthy, you send the servant. So she's a poor woman. She's certainly intelligent. She may not have formal education. And Jesus chooses this woman to reveal something great. You know, the Lord delights in using uh, simple instruments. I love the way in the Bible you see that Jesus, when he rises from the dead, and he says, now who shall be the first? I would have done things very different from Jesus. When I, if I was Christ and I rose from the dead, I would be thinking, I'm going to show myself first to the high priest and say, well, now what do you think? You know, or, uh, uh, you know, maybe the apostles, Peter, James, and John. But Jesus, the first one he chooses to show himself to is Mary. That woman, they said, don't let her touch you. She is a sinner. And when God reveals the good news about the great bounty in the land, he chooses lepers. Uh, Paul said, not many wise, not many noble. Jesus turned the world upside down. He got a bunch of fishermen, shepherds, tax collectors, common people. That should be encouraging for most of us. Some of you are highly educated, very wealthy, and you might think, what about me? Well, he did reach, you know, some people like that too. But uh, I, I like that, you know, Jesus shares the gospel with people that might be considered the off-scouring of society. That means there's hope for sinners. Amen? Amen. Something else is, uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yes, Jesus preached to great crowds, but Christ had a heart for individuals as well. You can think of a few other one-on-one -on -one meetings. Of course, you go to John chapter 3, he's meeting one-on-one -on -one with Nicodemus. And you might be thinking, how do we know what he said to Nicodemus if it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting? Well, Nicodemus became a believer, and he probably rehearsed the whole conversation. How do we know what Jesus said to this woman? Well, she later became a believer, and she probably shared with the disciples, this is what the conversation was. And so they were able to accurately record these things. But it's not only that. He has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Martha just before the resurrection of Lazarus, with Mary Magdalene at the tomb, with a demoniac by the sea. But the longest one-on-one -on -one conversation in the Bible is Jesus with the woman. Now, I could be wrong, but... It's, uh, I think it's up there in the top. And so this is a very important passage for us to consider. I'm glad that Jesus, in that 
one-on-one -on -one relationship, it tells us what he wants with each of us. The time that he took to personally commune with her and answer her questions and probe what her greatest needs were, he feels that way about every one of us. The Lord wants to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. He cares for each of us. He loves each one of us. Something else we notice about this story, you look in John 4, verse 7. Jesus says to her when she comes to the well, she's ready to ignore him because, like I said, the Samaritans, they had to pass the Jews all the time. But uh, just to give you one couple more little vignettes about the Samaritans and the Jews. One time when Jesus was passing through another town in Samaria, they said to Jesus, where are you going? He said, I'm going down to the feast. They said, if you're going to the feast to worship in Jerusalem, don't even come through our town. You're not going to find any bed and, and breakfast here. And they said, because they said, you're supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim. And James and John said, Lord, give us the power of Elijah. We will call fire down from heaven and burn them all up and kill them. This is what the apostles, Jesus' followers, and there's probably still some apostles today that feel that way about others, but <laughs> this is what the apostles are saying to Jesus. And Jesus said, oh, you don't know what spirit you're of. I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They wanted to burn up a whole Samaritan town, and they would have said, ah, just like Elijah, we got the Bible for it. <laughs> but those Samaritans, they didn't even want Jesus to come through their town if he was going to go to Jerusalem. So uh, it's they were prepared to just ignore each other. And so when she comes to get her water, she can tell by the way he dressed that he's a Jew. Maybe, you know, some of the Jews, they, they had blue tassels to help them remember the law of God. That's in the, the writings of Moses. And there were differences in their customs. You could look right away and you could tell. It's like, you know, if we have somebody that, that comes here and they're dressed wearing Indian garb or African garb, we'd be able to tell that. Well, they could tell right away he's a Jew or she's a Samaritan. And she planned on ignoring him. But instead, he kind of arrests her, her thinking and he asks her for a favor. He says, give me a drink. Now, when you go from Aramaic or Greek to English, it might sound like an order. Uh, implied in here is a polite request. So he's not saying, give me a drink. He's saying it like you and I would say, please give me a drink. There's kindness in this that doesn't always come through in the translation, some languages. So one of the things you notice right here, Jesus is thirsty. Jesus had a human body. He was 100% divine and 100% human, but you read just in this one story, he says, I'm thirsty, please give me a drink. It says in verse 6, he was weary from his journey. Did Jesus get tired like we get tired? Did he get sore muscles? Yeah. And then it says the disciples had gone away to buy food. He's hungry. Now you think about this. This is amazing to me. I just have a picture in my mind that um, the disciples go. They say, look, Lord, we got to go buy food. We don't have enough to get us all the way to Galilee. There's a town here in Sychar. We're going to go get some food. You sit down and rest. We see how tired you are. You were ministering. You were doing all this ministry down there when we were baptizing in uh, Judea. And we've walked, it's a very long, rugged walk, a lot of up and down hill, rocks and stuff. They said, you sit here and you rest. And hopefully there was maybe a little shade, but we don't know that. And so he's sitting there, and they walk away, and he's by himself. Here is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he can't get a drink. And he looks off in the well and takes a little rock. He drops it off and he goes... And you can see his reflection ripple down the bottom of this well. But he can't get the water. He's got to depend on somebody else to give him the water. Jesus could have said, I'm God, water, cup. I mean, he could have done that. But he accepted our lot. Do you know, Jesus never, ever performed a miracle for his own benefit. He always used his power because it was going to benefit others. I'm sure when he multiplied the bread to feed the people, there was some left over for him. But he principally used his power to be a blessing to others. And he said, will you please give me a drink? I like this in Desire of Ages, that beautiful book on the life of Christ. There's a quote, the king of heaven came to this outcast soul asking a service at her hands. He who made the ocean, who controls the waters of the great deep, who opened the springs and the channels of the earth, rested from his weariness at Jacob's well and was dependent upon a stranger's kindness for even the gift of a drink of water. 
Now, Jesus actually uses some good psychology there. If he had offered her something right then, she would have ignored him. But because he requests a drink of water, if you live in the Middle East back then, that was one of the, uh, the smartest things you could do. So Jesus, you notice something in verse 9? He ignores the racial barriers. That's a good lesson for us. Uh, now that his disciples are gone, he just he, he shows her the same kind of respect. He knew that they would have been really shocked. They find out when they come back. She's shocked. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews, it's like she said, don't you know that Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Where have you been? Haven't you heard? This is how we're supposed to treat each other. And Jesus totally ignores that and engages her. You know, it's also, we're going to deal in our uh, next message about some of the lessons we can learn for, about evangelism in the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. The disciples have gone to town to try to spare him exposure to the Samaritans, and here she is. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth, and he said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is a very, very important verse. Did you hear what? I want to give it to you again because I don't know if everyone caught it when I first said it. Acts 10, 34 and 35. People ask me the question periodically, Pastor Doug, what about all these people who lived in Australia, Africa, South America? They never heard about the gospel until missionaries came to them, you know, 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago. Were all of those thousands and millions of people, were they all automatically lost? because they could never hear the gospel. There are some churches that teach yes, because it is true. There's only one name given among men whereby we are saved. Nobody is saved by their works. Everyone who is saved is saved by Jesus. Amen? But there are some people in these countries who haven't heard Jesus' name, but they're listening to Jesus' spirit. And that's why Peter said, he opened his mouth, in truth I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. There is hope for these people, but so many of these people don't know about God. That's why missionaries need to go. It's the exception, but there are exceptions. Did God have Naaman? Did Elijah stay with that woman of Tyre and Zidon? There were people that God heard their prayers so we've got to be careful about being exclusive and thinking, I'm fortunate because I'm Christians, I've got a Bible, I know there's not going to be anyone in heaven but us. I think when we get there, we're going to be finding out that there were people in every land who through the Spirit, through angels, they walked in the light that they had. And in spite of the darkness around them, a God is going to show mercy on them. And so I'm not in that group of pastors that is dogmatically excluding the rest of the human race that maybe didn't have the benefit of a missionary. I don't think that's reasonable. Matthew 10, verse 42, it says, And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, he will not lose his reward. You know, even in the Arab culture, if someone asked for a drink of water, they would go out of their way. It was considered the highest service to give water to someone who is thirsty, especially in this more arid region. And so when Jesus said, can I have a drink of water, she felt terribly conflicted. She planned on ignoring that Jew at the well. But now he's just played that card of a drink of water. And he is she is required by the, just the custom of a deeply ingrained custom that if someone is thirsty, even if it's your enemy, you give them a drink of water. And so he uses this to now, she says, but you're not supposed to ask for that. Knowing the gift of God, what's his response to her? John 4.10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God. Now, when he says the gift of God, what is the gift of God? It's in the previous chapter. God so loved the world, he gave his son. So when Jesus said, if you knew, what is eternal life? That they might know you, the only God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. If you knew the gift of God, friends, do you know the gift of God? Jesus is the gift. 
And who, he doesn't say what it is, who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, how do we get eternal life? How do we get the living water? Ask. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, is that just a metaphor that was true back then? Or is it still true today that God offers living water? Amen. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, have you ever really been thirsty? Now, I lived in the desert. And I got lost in deserts, once in Nevada, once in the mountains of Southern California. I got lost in a place where they've actually made National Geographic programs about people that got lost and died up where I live. It was a hot, rugged, steep desert mountain. Uh, Nathan went up there with me during COVID. He had never been there, and he'll testify. That is a rough, rough country. I woke up one morning with my friend Greg. He's the one who gave me the great controversy, by the way. We used to go hiking. And uh, we'd take these little day packs with us, and we'd go exploring. We'd go looking for caves. We'd find Indian artifacts. We'd just go looking, hiking these desert mountains because there's nobody out there so rugged. So we went exploring. And um, we used to play a little game to see who is the toughest. You know, we, uh, we'd go on hiking uphill, and whoever said, let's stop and rest, we figured you are weaker. You know, we, we were young, man. You got too much testosterone. You're trying to prove something to somebody. And, and so we'd be hiking along, and if you had to stop and you said, I need a drink, you're weak. So we'd both try and see who could go the longest without saying, I need a breath or I need a drink. So we went off exploring. We're plodding along, and I'm going, man, I'm dying, but I'm not going to tell him, so I just keep going. Finally, we get to this great lookout where obviously it was a great place. There. We're miles away from the, the water and the canyon, and, and this is Palm Springs, and it's hot desert. Sun's coming up, getting hotter. Finally, we sit down. And I said, okay, I need a break. All right, we need a break. We sit down. And uh, I said, you got the trail mix? He said, uh, yeah, I got the trail mix. I said, you got the water? He said, no, I thought you had the water. He always brought in his day pack a whole gallon of water. And I, yeah, we didn't mind sharing back then. Any of you remember the days when you were kids and you used to like share a Coke bottle with your friends? And you weren't worried about pandemics and contamination. How did we survive? I don't understand it. It's amazing. Eat three pounds of dirt growing up and you somehow survive. And anyway, so I said, you don't have the water? I said, you kidding? He said, looks at me and he says, you don't have the water? I said, I don't have the water. And we said, oh, well, that ought to be priority one. And uh, I don't remember, one of us said, there should be water over in Chino Canyon, this other canyon that was off. So we went hiking. Now we're getting thirsty. We're really thirsty. And we get down to this canyon, and the place where there normally was water, they were not year-round pools. They're dry as a bone. We hike up and down thinking we'll find a pool somewhere in the canyon. It's all dry. You get to a place where you can't hike any further down because there's a cliff. The water goes over waterfalls. You can't go all the way down. So we have to retrace our steps. Now we are really, really thirsty. And do you know when you get thirsty enough, I always say, what's the thing in the back of your throat? What do you call that? The dually dad that hangs down back there. <laughs> do you know when you get, what's it? You, yeah, whatever that was. That's what it is. And <laughs> you get thirsty enough, and that swells up. Most of you have never been that thirsty. But it, and you try to swallow it. You can't. I found that out. But it, it, it's swollen up, and your lips are chapped. You can't lick your lips, they just split. Your lips are chapped, and just you're all dehydrated. You're not thinking clearly, and you're stumbling. You, you lose your balance when you get dehydrated. You're stumbling along, and we got so thirsty, and we had to hike over these two hills, and we realized the final shortcut. We knew there was water back down in our canyon. The closest place was a place where it was called uh, Clear Pool. And uh, it got to where we were over the edge and we could hear off in the distance water trickling and we're going downhill we're skinning our knees we're running into cactus uh, that we would normally try to avoid don't even stop to pull it out you got a little choya ball sticking to your legs because all you can think about is water and uh, my sandals broke and so I pick up my broken sandal I'm hiking with one good sandal one bad sandal and we got over the hump and we got down to where the, uh, we looked, and there was, in the canyon, there's this one pool. It looked like a big peanut-shaped pool, sandy bottom, turquoise, cold water. 
And Greg got there before me because I had a broken sandal. And he got down on his knees and he put his face in the water and he started to drink. I just jumped over the top of him right into the water <laughs> and started, I thought, I want to soak it up through every pore. And I just started drinking the water. And whenever I hear Jesus say, are you thirsty? Do you want to drink of water? You know, some wonderful passages in the Bible about Jesus offering us that living water. You can read here, and uh, I've got several verses that talk about this. What is the living water? Jesus said, if you ask me, I will give you the living water. What is that water? Here it is, Genesis 1, verse 2. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. What is the promise? He that hungers and thirsts will be filled. And floods on dry gowns, I will pour my spirit. Bingo. There you have it. What is that water? The Holy Spirit. If we ask Jesus, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that talking to you, you would ask for him, that living water. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Friends, are you thirsty? He says, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. He will give us that living water. Last words in the Bible, Revelation 21, are some of the last words. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely. He'll give it freely to him that thirsts. Friends, are you like that woman at the well? You're finding that uh, the things of the world don't satisfy and you're thirsty for something better? You feel like maybe you're alone and sinful and separated from God? And Jesus, he goes out of his way to come to your city of Sychar to meet you because he wants to save you. He wants to give you that living water. He wants a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. He says, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask him and he would give you freely that living water. How many of you would like to say, Lord, I'm thirsty. Please give me that living water. The Holy Spirit, wash away my sins and help me to have that relationship with you. Is that your prayer? Then we're gonna sing about it. Why don't you stand? It'll be in your hymnals if you have one there and it's also on the screen. 493, fill my cup and then we'll pray as we conclude. Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this 
thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make it all. I can say, Lord, give me that living water. Amen. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this story that shows Jesus' love for every individual and the journey that he's willing to make from heaven to earth, from Judea to Samaria to save even one. Lord, I know that you want to give us this living water. You said that you came into the world to seek and to save the lost, and we all qualify. Lord, I pray that right now we can experience your cleansing, that living water, the Holy Spirit coming into our minds and our hearts and help us to have that, that artesian well within each one of us that will satisfy. Please bless, Lord, each person in their lives. I pray that we'll find comfort and encouragement from Jesus and help us to sense your presence all the time as we go from this place today. We thank you and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, friends. You have a blessed Sabbath. Remember, of course, that we receive our offerings still at the door. So you'll see your ushers and deacons out there, and we appreciate your, your faithfulness there as well. God bless.